Max Wardell, OverheadAthletics.com. Welcome back to the video. Today we're going to talk about human movement and the influence of human movement or the contributors to human movement that we need to understand as human movement professionals, as clinicians. And this goes for your rehabilitation professionals, your strength and conditioning coaches, your skill coaches, and even really your sport coaches. A lot of times what we see, especially in the healthcare industry and the sports performance industry, are individuals who are hyper focused in one area, one scientific area, or one they have one area of expertise. And you really can move far into the research and get a lot of information out there doing so, but you're not going to be able to actually work with athletes or, or fully understand how the human movement apparatus, the musculoskeletal uh, system, moves through three dimensional space by only pigeonholing yourself into one or even two domains. So what we've done here is we've kind of drawn human movement at the center in a little bit of a web. All of these different attributes, as well as more, that I really just don't have space to write on here, are contributors to how we move, and they need to be understood by the clinician if the clinician is to alter movement, improve movement, or analyze human movement. And I think this is really the root cause of a lot of the issues we see is that individuals specific to one domain are very popular or their ideas become very popular and those ideas proliferate and then we have training methods that don't account for any of the other variables or don't adequately account for the other variables. We end up with inadequate training practices and excessive injuries and decreased performance of athletes or athletes reaching a, a plateau and never moving beyond that. So to understand this, we need to know that human movement is complex, which is different in our definition when we talk about uh, skill acquisition and human movement than complicated. Complicated is something that can be predictable and figured out. We can actually figure out specific specific numbers or specific details of something in a complicated system. A complicated system being um, a machine. We can figure out exactly how these gears are going to work, which is going to in turn tell us how many times this belt is going to move around this apparatus or how many times this lever arm is going to uh, rotate or how much force it's going to produce. A complex system is a bit different. A complex system is not predictable. There's many unpredictable components of a complex system. And the argument would be that human movement is a complex as opposed to complicated system. Complicated, there's many things playing into it and there's a lot of moving parts, but it's all predictable. We can figure it out. Complex, there's many moving parts and many systems that are interplaying with one another, but it's unpredictable. We're not able to predict the outcome or outcomes. We have complicated aspects of human movement that interplay with other complex systems. So without getting in too much depth there, let's understand that there are many, many things that can influence how we move. Psychology. We know that mood can either be a depressor or suppression of human movement, or it can be a facilitator. That's why we see guys get pumped up before games, and that's why we see that when somebody's depressed, they're not going to be able to produce as much power. So anything that derives from the central nervous system, the brain, the psychology is going to play a very large role in that. Likewise, what nutrients you get into your system, how those nutrients are metabolized, your bioenergetics, how muscles contract, the physics. Lever arm length, moment arms, moment of inertia, torque, force, speed, all of those things, velocity, perception, which is really more so um, our uh, perception of the environment and of what's going on around us. So our vision, we're actually seeing real things. We, are ha we have a um, perception of the world around us which is a little bit different than sensation, which is our ability to utilize um, different sensor organs um, and afferent information coming in. We also have motor control, which is kind of a, a conglomeration of multiple things, but it's, it's really our ability to control our movement. We also have our anatomy. 
the orientation of muscles, where they're attached, their architecture, how they're formed, the joint surfaces, um, and then neuroscience. The neuroscience being how do the nerves work? How does the brain work? What are our reflexes? All those things have multiple bifurcations. Neuroscience, you could look at uh, cognitive neuroscience. You can look at uh, peripheral nerves. You can look at action potentials. Um, perception can have to do with auditory information. It can have to do with uh, visual information, how light is reflected off of a surface. Um, anatomy, your joint surfaces, your muscle architecture, your muscle length, sarcomere length, um, individual cellular anatomy. Um, sensation can be sensation from different types of receptors in your body, um, different mechanoreceptors and all different things. Um, as well as you know any of these things, the physics, the physics of how different joint surfaces move on one another, um, as well as how the body moves from um, a rigid mechanic standpoint or a rigid dynamic standpoint, and then also deformable body mechanics. How, how do tissues perform um, and respond under stress? As, and then physiology, how do we adapt to that? How do we supply energy to uh, systems and, and how do we metabolize things? So we have all these systems at play, all these domains at play, and they all have overlap over one another. Um, depending on what we're looking at, some have more overlap than others. But what's happened and the real problem that's, that's occurred out there thus far is that we've, we've seen all of these programs that are inadequate. We've seen bodybuilding style programs, powerlifting style programs for our baseball players, for our football players. Um, and, and it comes down to, as um, some would put it, a stranglehold. Franz Bosch puts it as cognitive psychology at a stranglehold on motor learning and motor control. Physiology or exercise physiologists had a stranglehold on sport performance um, and strength and conditioning. So what we've seen is like physiology. We, all of the programs are designed on energy metabolism and bioenergetics and how to grow muscles and those sorts of things. And then now we're even seeing it with physics where I've seen numerous individuals undergo um, 3D motion capture, biomechanical analysis and video analysis that only focuses on the physics of the throw, for example. And what happens there is the physics can tell us part of the story, but there's something else going on, which is the movement apparatus. We can, we can focus on how the body moves, like what the movements are, but that doesn't tell us why we moved like that. And that's why we need all of these other domains, because we know you moved like this, but that doesn't really tell us anything about it. You may be very inefficient, and we know you're inefficient, but why are you inefficient? Is it because your anatomy? Is it because you, you don't have any hip motion, because the way your hip socket is formed is is inadequate you know you have a cam lesion which or a, a pincer lesion which is essentially extra bone around the, the hip socket or is it because you don't have adequate muscle length um, you, your muscles are too short you don't have uh, flexibility which plays into neuroscience you, you're not able to actually lengthen your muscles and your extensibility is poor or is it because of another variable, which is you've just never learned to move like that. You've searched for energy in the wrong place. Just like that kid hitting the pinata, you reach way, way back, get yourself all out of position because it, you're searching for energy, but you're not doing it in the right place. And it, it's motor control. So I've seen numerous in individuals undergo motion capture, get analyzed by a biomechanical engineer, and then they come back and their throw looks exactly the same because there was no indication of how they should go about correcting that and likewise there was no understanding of why they actually moved like that. Your movement's inefficient. Great. Why? So that's really what we need to understand all of these variables for. When we talk about the physics, is it just how the limbs move in space or is it also about how the joint surfaces are going to move on each other as a result of that large gross body movement? So all the biomechanical engineers and biomechanists out there could tell you, well, you, you really should get more horizontal abduction in the throw and really get back there because it's highly correlated with velocity. Well, is it? It is to a certain point, and then it's not after that because when you go back like that, what happens? The humeral head goes forward in the socket and stretches the front of the capsule. So then you're talking about, well, I'm implicating different 
tension loads on the front of the shoulder, which can lead to labral tears and shoulder pathology. Likewise, am I able to control that range of motion and actually stabilize that? Do I have motor control in those positions? So we have to incorporate all of these domains into our practice if we want to really understand human movement. And I commend researchers who have one area or two areas of, of interest on this spectrum, but that's not how the body moves. And, and it's easy for us to say once we get into a specific domain that now we understand human movement because we understand the physics of the movement. Well, you might understand the physics of the movement, but if you don't understand how muscle length plays a role in those physics or how motor control plays a role or how the body is going to perceive sensory information, from the neuroscience perspective, uh, utilize those senses, integrate those senses, or how they perceive their environment. It's it's not it's not going to result in any sort of substantial change, or it's going to neglect major components that are going to result in the most efficacious um, interventions for those athletes. So we have to understand all of these things. We have to know that traditionally, physics, physiology are really the two main domains that we've seen programs based on or we've seen exercise regimens and throwing mechanics interventions and all these things based on it's the physics and the physiology and a lot of times the physics lacks context because it doesn't account for how the body is able to control itself just because something is the most efficient from the physics standpoint doesn't mean the body can control that most efficient movement as well generally it can Generally, the most efficient things from a physics perspective are also the most efficient from a motor control perspective, but that's not always true. Because you could say, from a physics perspective, we'd like you to get 75 degrees of thoracic rotation, so you have more range of motion to accelerate into rotation as you come forward towards the target. But from a motor control perspective and from an anatomical perspective, we know that that's not true because we can't acquire those ranges. So... Certain things have to account for other things when we look at this, meaning we can't just look at the physics. I was told one time that, hey, if you supinate as you're accelerating and bring the ball, it allows the ball to come in closer to the center of rotation, which therefore would allow you to have less drag force and generate more angular velocity. Okay, let's say it did do that. What about the anatomy? Because what about the anatomy of the elbow? Well, the, the elbow isn't very stable in supination. The elbow actually gaps significantly. I did my doctoral studies in the cadaver lab, jacking around a bunch of elbows, cutting the UCL, pulling it into valgus in different positions. And I'll tell you, when you're supinated, it gaps. It gaps much more. That's not a good thing for the UCL. Pronation, well, the ball's not as close to the center of rotation, so I didn't maximize this, but I maximized the integrity of the system and made it more robust to stress. So it's always a combination of these things. There's always a gray area and that's where we have to perform. But my, my inclination is if you want to get the best at human movement, and this is my journey as well, it's like you got to learn as much as you can about all these different domains. And then the ones that you don't know about, you need to spend more time learning about them. And if you just go based on this or this, you're going to miss maybe the most important context and information that's going to be relevant to altering and improving human movement.